My name is Jerome Sidnam. I'm very happy to be here today. And I'd like to share some of my personal experiences from the DJ producer perspective. Um, I became fascinated with the concept of the DJ from when I was about 10 years old, and that was in 1977 in Ibadan, Nigeria, where I was born and raised. I remember this date clearly because it was also the same summer that I was able to buy my first sort of 12-inch records. You know, I think it was a Donna summer, definitely the village people, and uh, I think uh, maybe a, a chic record. But, but they were 12 inches, not albums. That was the difference. <laughs> so um, this sort of empowered me because I was different from my mates. I had 12 inches, not albums. But the whole DJ thing sort of solidified itself more from my home because my parents were actually more of a freaky situation than I could ever be in my life. They had parties all the time soirees all the time, and this was in Ibad in Nigeria. And as a 10-year-old then, I used to sort of sneak out of my room, put a little t-shirt on, some jeans, and pretend with my little huge afro, and pretend that I was um, invisible, and sneak into the living room behind the DJ coffin, and watch all the drama unfold from there. <laughs> so that's how that happened. But what I also used to do at the same time was, um, Besides my fixation on the image of the DJ, which, which is very important, uh, the, there was a main guy in Ibadan who used to play at my parents' parties. His name was Alex Conde. He was also on the radio, sort of a legend in, in that area of the world. Um, he used to sort of let me go through his album record collection, and I would very often sort of project myself into the images I saw on these album covers. So I, I would imagine myself behind like some big ass mixing board with a million knobs making a hot jam, even, even when I was 10 years old. So that's how it sort of started to build. But then where was I? I was in provincial Ibadan, Nigeria, right? So <laughs> nothing, there's nothing much I could do to catapult myself into the future from there, except fantasize. So it was about 1981 when I first moved to England. And it was a normal thing for sort of Nigerians to go to school in England after sort of an initial education. So we, we got here, but so me and my mates, the first thing we had to do was like, go to a nightclub, go to a real nightclub. Where we're in England, you gotta go to a nightclub. So the first nightclub we went to was the Empire Ballroom in Leicester Square. I don't even know whether that still exists, so anyone remembers those days. And it was during the day as well, but I don't think it qualifies for an all day, but definitely we went to the Empire Ballroom. So regardless of how cheesy that was, it was still the most amazing experience that also reinforced this desire to be this sort of DJ producer type character. So the next couple of years, I would spend some summers in, in, in New York and some summers in London trying to explore the club scene and, and, and you know, try and get into clubs. And Grace Jones was around, so we were wearing some makeup and leather and just trying to be cool in any way we could. But it wasn't until 1984 when I actually moved to New York for the first time that things just shifted gears like immediately into the fast lane. Some of, some of, uh, some of my mates were already ahead of me, but I remember very clearly the very, very first weekend I got to New York, I went to the Paradise Garage on a Friday night, which is like the half gay, half straight night, but I didn't know that at the time. Walking into the Paradise Garage, Culture shock, simultaneous, like three or four of them. First of all, it was a gay club. I had never seen so many gay people in one room together. I wasn't afraid of it. It was just very unusual. And the sound system, the Richard Long sound system, just didn't make any sense. It was too good. Larry Levan on the turntables. What kind of music was this playing? I didn't even know what house music was. It was like, what is, what is this? What is this eclectic mix of... Of what? They don't play it on the radio. They don't have it at the record stores in London. What is this stuff? So we were right in, like, you know, first weekend, burning candles both ends, doing a bit of drugs, whatever, like, boom. From, from Paradise Garage, we would go to clubs like Zanzibar, David Mancuso's Loft. Everything was so different. We used to go to the hip-hop clubs, the reggae clubs. Every single club was, like, 
going to another world or another country. And then it, it was like seven days a week. The Paradise Garage didn't even close till noon. So even at that age, we were just doing it, caning it, you know, what, just doing it all, trying to absorb everything. It was crazy. <laughs> and so, Suddenly, we, I realized why I was in New York, obviously, to, not only to go to school, but to also try to become a DJ and, 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 and fit into this sort of fantastic society. But after like a few weeks of doing all this partying, everything became sort of overwhelming. I, I felt like, like an ant in this super system, this huge underground network. I was like, how do I even take a first step? Where do you begin? Like, what do you do? So, I guess after the initial hangover, I decided that the only thing to do was a bit of research. So what I would do was go to the local record shops. I guess then it would be Vinyl Mania, Discorama, and Rock and Soul. And be a bit of a fly on the wall, see how other DJs, customers, communicated with each other, see what records they were playing, sort of check them out a little bit and try to understand or hope someone will say hello to me one day. And fortunately enough for me, um, a gentleman named Walter Gibbons, the legendary Walter Gibbons, who was one of the first disco DJs and, and also a studio remixer, kind of was like, yo, Jay, you seem to be hanging out here all the time. Um, can I help you with anything? I was like, well, I need some advice. I need to, I basically, I want to be like you. <laughs> and um, he said something really important to me. He said, well, the first thing you have to do, Jerome, is study the history of this music. You have to, you have to learn how this sound got to where it is. We're talking about this explosion of uh, house techno, all this new electronica that was bursting out everywhere. You have to know the underground before you know the overground, and you have to start from there. So when you buy one house record, buy this. And luckily, he worked at the record store, so he was extremely helpful. So I, I, I immersed myself into it. So collecting vinyl, practicing my mixing, and clubbing with every penny I had. And I was one of those guys, I didn't give a shit. I was like, I'd line, I'd be the first at the door. You know, it's like the club opens at midnight. And then it's me standing there, and then I'll be the last one to leave. I had to know, and I needed to be down. Now, this is really important because this, this method that I took from um, Walter Gibbons, it, it, it really became a, a very influential. The, 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 the openness that I was given allowed me to, 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 to really absorb all genres of music, like everything, like every single aspect I, I, I just rediscovered. And this ultimately became the backbone of my journey and, and, and my knowledge to allow me to be a good DJ, uh, a reasonably successful a &R person and a record producer. So that was extremely important. Um, but we're still in New York. We're still dreaming. So the next phase of the operation was how do we get a club job? So I'll spend, you know, obviously, you know, I already told you, I'm spending hour after hour, like, practicing my mixes. So I said, well, you know what? No one's doing it. I go out a lot. I started giving people sort of mixtapes every week, like, um, strategically. The bartenders, the club manager. And then they started people in different clubs, and people started enjoying getting them because no one else is actually doing that. Because it was, it, everything was already so set up. Like if you were DJing and you didn't make it, you'd put your mate to cover you. It, it was all, there was this hierarchy that existed. So I didn't even see hope. But I was like, well, at least they can hear my mix. Unfortunately for me, um, I got that random call. Somebody canceled. They couldn't find anyone else. I couldn't believe it. And they dig down to the bottom of the barrel and found me. Jerome, can you make it? No cell phone, so it was on the answering machine. And of course I could, and you know how that shit is. You, you get to the club and you're so nervous and overwhelmed, like coming from sleepy Baden into the sort of the bowels and throes of the Big Apple. Couldn't put the needle on the record. It was just like, damn, am I, is this happening? Is this real? It was very overwhelming, fantastic stuff. <laughs> so, you know, gulp, vodka, big glass, relax a bit. 
It worked out and led to a very successful re residency for a few years at a club called Nell's in New York. Now, this is where it gets tricky. Once you're now in this sort of like hype scene, all these doors open up, suddenly you're everyone's best friend, everyone wants to get in because it was the hardest club to get into New York at the time. <laughs> so I didn't actually lose my mind. It was that easy because I was caning it, doing everything, anything that was around, I was like swallowing it, just like all oh, sex, lots and lots of that. Um, you know, you know, you know, so. <laughs> Um, so basically, all I could think of is if they fire me and then suddenly my green card doesn't come through, I'll end up back in a bad end. So, and I was like, no way in hell. So I, it, this just sort of cooled me out completely. So I remained focused and extremely competitive. And eventually, this led to um, a lucrative position as an A&R person at Atlantic Records. Now we're jumping all the way to 89. I have to go back to 87 first. During 87, during this whole club hype, something strange happened in New York. When the Paradise Garage closed, it was sort of a very weird and sad, sad um, period. There was a, a, a drug epidemic in, in, in New York called crack. <laughs> and everyone was smoking it. <laughs> You know, the rich people were smoking the MDA. That wasn't even a middle-class drug. That was just like an upper-class white drug. Uh, the queens were doing rush and smoking crack. That was a drug in New York. So between the, the, the bad medication for HIV, you know, all that uh, Z, XZT or whatever, that stuff, so many people just died. So many amazing people. So it was, it was also really sad. So New York sort of got quiet as this other sort of house and techno was sort of bursting out. But anyway, now we're at the record label, and this is where things become even more interesting, because now I, I'm seeing everything from a different vantage point. I'm seeing the, the, the budgets, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the biases, I'm seeing the racism, I'm seeing the payolas, I'm seeing the kickbacks. And the first thing, obviously, naturally, when you work for a major corporation, you're, you're, you're probably going to be involved with, for me, I was in urban music, so that was sort of more R&B based, and then hip hop was still trying to, to, to nudge its way in. Um, the first thing that we noticed was uh, some of our colleagues were throwing money at house and techno. And th this was, the f the, again, as always, the first mistake. You can't throw money at a new product that needs, that needs nurturing and development. <laughs> you have to give it the exact amount of money it needs, not too much money, and with all this too much money, there was no daytime radio, there was no video support, there was nothing. It was nothing. It was, it was just like, well, here's tons of money, give us an album, give us a, a couple of new records, and, and here's another 15 grand to remix this pop record, and here's another 25 for you. And all this time, there's no image in this music. It's just this music that ended up being a, a music that didn't meet the bottom line. So at the end of the year, or at the end of the quarter or whatever, when they do their accounting, it's like, this, this, this stuff isn't making any money. And in just as fast as they were interested, they got un uninterested just as fast. Now, something else happens. So this music goes back to the streets, right? We know that the independent labels were making a killing off this music, which is where the killing is supposed to be made as long as it's being shared. But at least it wasn't corporate and going to some sort of random uh, public trading account. So that music goes back to the street. So the, what, what is the result of that? The result of that, this faceless music, it increases the visibility of the DJ. And then you start, then this, this, this new phenomenon of the international DJ occurs because it's, it's still a faceless music. Now with the hype of the international DJ comes a different kind of commercialization. Hence the raves that we saw, the stats on that, and every, you know, I mean, that was, I, I don't know whether, whether that's not in Manchester, the raves, was that, was that a Manchester thing? I don't know. But it was definitely, you know, a UK phenomenon. But that was pure uh, commercial exploitation. The, the, there is no real creative value in any of that stuff. Uh, oh, did I just insult somebody? Oh, shit, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I wasn't talking about the Hacienda. I, was <laughs> I love Danny Rampling. <laughs> um... <laughs> um 
So basically, you, you, you have different kinds of exploitation going on from di different areas. But w what also happens with this new success of the international DJ is this uh, discussion that, that's supposed to be one of the subjects of, 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 of this, uh, of this uh, episode of TEDx. Is, is there any conflict between commercial success and artistic integrity? Now, from this initial success of the DJ, there, there, there are tons of examples of, 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 of conflicts. But there are also examples the other way. Let's talk about the negative. Um, uh, take, I'm not going to use anyone's names, take a successful record producer uh, who has had four or five hit singles, remixed five or six other hit records. Just, you know, their growth is exponential, just like boom. You know, they're just large, you know, from, from club to auditorium to stadium. Most of the time, if you, if you, you see, the thing is that people always forget this. Most of the time, those characters tend to not be satisfied with the fact that their own initial original fans really dig their music and come to their shows and are happy to pay. They, they slip into this sort of murky, over-commercialized, generic, crap music thing. Uh, I don't even know what to call it. And, and, and that generally backfires. You see, you, you, lose, you lose credibility of your fans. You lose, it doesn't happen all the time. Some people sell right through, but you can't count those five people. You have to think about the 30 people that you forgot about who were once hot and where are they now? You see, we always forget like, that the turnover is so fast. You're like, oh shit, what happened to that one? What happened to that one? That's what happened. Then on the other hand of the argument, you have so many examples of, of successful DJs who um, don't compromise their, 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 their uh, quality control, who, oh, Jeff Mills, the people like that, you know, you know, Uncle Jeff, you know, he's still nailing the techno down proper right now. How old is he, like 50, in his late mid 50s, you know, so that, that's your example. So the, the question becomes, it, 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 goes down to the individual. Are you capable of, of um, ignoring these extra temptations? Do you have the wisdom? Do you, do you have the, the, the patience? Do you have the ability? It, it, it's, it becomes an, it's an individual question, but it's so easy to fall into that trap. So while all this is happening, a lot, uh, <laughs> I'm glad I wrote that down. While all this is happening, something even more terrible was happening, which some, some of you I'm sure know about, but maybe a lot of people don't, and I, I recommend you to research it. Now we're flying through the late 80s into the 90s. Uh, I'll go back a bit to the late 80s. Certain powers in, in, in global corporate industry all sat around a table and decided to kill vinyl. We're not talking about Richie Horton trying to kill vinyl because of Beatport. That's not even interesting. We're talking, about, we're talking about real bad, you know, bad asses that are not even working at the label, not, not the vice president, not the president, no, the other, their boss's boss. And what they did was they went around most countries, Eastern Europe, South America, especially in Africa, and bought up all the pressing plants and literally put them on ships and dumped them into the ocean. And that's a fact. Research it because they wanted to sort of recontrol the flow of music and, and create sort of a new export market and influence so-called third world countries. Now, I'm glad that there was a backlash to that because uh, we've seen a growth in domestic uh, artists manufactured locally, promoted locally, and it, it's more like they're exporting it. I mean, I mean, even with Nigeria, like all that Nollywood, all that stuff, it, it, it comes as a backlash of of other people trying to over control you. But it's really sad that they did that. We're still suffering from that today, by the way, because they wanted you to buy CDs or something. So as we see all these things, what are we left with? We're left with, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. I mean, the most important thing, if you're like a, if you're, you're a singer songwriter, the music business is all about songs. You know, I mean, this is the backbone of the music business is songs. It's all about songs. I've, I generally make a lot of instrumental music these days. I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about the whole, um, you know, a, a, the larger picture. But there's also another 
ignorance that you know people don't really embrace songs. It's like the minute you put a you know in this independent electronic world, the minute you you make a track with a song, uh, oh it's oh it's pop immediately. Like wh why can't I make like a an independent record that'll never have a video because no one's going to pick it up, and and still be played in the same club? Why do I have to hear the same generic crap over and over again when I go and hear a, a tech house DJ? Well, I mean. And more than likely, when, when the other more well-informed DJ, you know, like a Laurent Gagné or something, plays like five different styles of music and then goes back to techno, uh, that's why he's been DJing for over 20 years, right? Because he knows how to like flip it, enlighten, and educate at the same time. So we have to remember all these things. Always good to, to, to embrace yourself uh, with, with all kinds of music regardless of how genre-specific whatever you're doing might be. It doesn't matter what, what kind of music you do. That's up to you. You're every, we're all individuals. But once you, once you embrace all forms of music and, and, and really try, you, you, there, there will be, for sure, an absolutely positive influence on whatever you do, whether directly or indirectly. Very important. It's like, but people don't really do that enough. And then to, to, to wrap up uh, what I'm saying, um, because otherwise I'll go on forever, is, is there's so, if you go on Beatport, for example, there's, there's so much bad music. There's so much bad music. It's like, for me to buy, and I buy all kinds of things, for me to buy, you know, 10 tracks takes me three hours. Sometimes I have to listen to 900 tracks to buy 10 tracks. And now, this might seem discouraging, but most of those people who make those music are actually idiots. So they're, 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 they're forgiven. I forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. So there's always, bottom line is that, uh, my brothers and sisters, that there's always space for the fresh perspective. There's always space. There's always space for the fresh perspective. Thanks for listening to me.